Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of my faithful, and kindle them in the fire of their heart. Send forth your Spirit, and they shall be created. That shall be near the face of the earth, and of prayer. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit, instruct the hearts of my faithful, that the by the same Spirit, and be always truly wise, and by the joy of your consolation. With the same Christ, our Lord. Our name is Seat of Wisdom. In the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. So, good morning, brothers. Praying that everybody had a restful night. And let's just begin with some preliminary issue, uh, not so much connected with our discussion for today, uh, just to wake us up. Uh, you remember that in Luke chapter 4, there is a whole question about uh, Jesus uh, going to Nazareth, you know, into the synagogue, and then uh, the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed him, and then he read from it, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me, and so on and so forth. Very familiar passage of scripture. And, of course, uh, we know that that passage is uh, related, it's actually a quotation from Isaiah chapter 61, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me, and so on and so forth. But, it's just something very interesting that I stumbled across some time ago as I was looking at the text. My question is, why actually did Jesus go to Nazareth? Why, why did he make that long trip to go to Nazareth? I guess he could have gone anywhere else, you know, to do that. But it's interesting that, you know, then he goes on to, to declare, you know, to, of course, to, um, to declare the Lord's year of favor. Year of favor from the Lord. And as we are familiar with that whole question about the year of favor of the Lord, actually the Jubilee year. Well, it's interesting that um, if you take the question of the sabbatical year from the book of Leviticus chapter 25 read even from verse 13 it says in this jubilee year each of you shall return to his property in other versions each of you shall return to his home his land and the reason why Jesus went to Nazareth is that that's what you do on it sabbatical year, you go home. And that's why he was in Nazareth. Went to Nazareth, it was a sabbatical year, you go home. Return to your property, return to your home, wherever you are. It's interesting, the consciousness of the gospel writer to be small, small details. They are always going back to the Pentateuch. Oh. I could very well have said, well, Jesus went to a certain synagogue and did this and this. No, no, no. Went to Nazareth. Oh. That's what you do in a sabbatical year. Now, the other thing that I just wanted to mention, is again, another very, very familiar passage of Scripture, that's why I want to start today's conference on. That's from Mark chapter 4, reading from verse 1 and following. The parable of the sower. One of the parables that we know uh, literally by heart. We are so familiar with it. We preached on it hundreds of times. And there's really nothing new um, that I want to say. Except just to bring your attention to one little fact. Because we'll be talking about uh, the scripture all week and I said to you I won't quote from a physics book I'll quote from the scripture and so this passage which speaks about um, really speaks about the word of God and our reaction to the word of God is something that I thought we should just uh, pick something from now, 
it says, you know, the sower went out to sow first, you know, some of the seeds fell along the path and the birds came and you know, picked it up. Some fell on rocky ground, you know, and they sprouted, but for lack of fruit, they withered, and some fell among thorns, and they grew together and thorns took them. And then in the explanation of these passages, it begins to say, first and foremost, that the seed that fell on the path, and the birds came and picked them, uh, came to Satan, as it were, you know, when one hears the word of God, Satan immediately, you know, takes that word to the person that's not even hear it. And goes on to say, and those who fall on those seeds which fall upon the rock, uh, you know, those who hear the word of God and for tribulations, you know, and so on of life, you know, word of God is gone. And finally, he says, look, uh, finally, uh, word of God falls on this stony ground and says, well, that's the case of those who hear the word of God and take it in, but the desires of their thoughts and their desires and so on stifle these words. And looks very, in fact, what, what it says is that, but the cares of the world and the delight and riches and the desire for other things. What else are we talking about? There are three categories of evil, as it were, or things that are dangerous to the word of God that, that might approach my soul. So the first one is Satan. Satan is capable of frustrating the word of God from being active in your life. Satan, number one. Number two, rocky ground to the circumstances in which we live the persecutions and the tribulations and so on and so forth circumstances the third one the desires of one's heart and look at the progression of thoughts the first one is satan that's bad the second one are the circumstances in which we live. Worse. But the worst are the desires of my own heart. It's worse than what Satan can do. The enemy without can be bad. But it's not worse than the enemy within. The most dangerous foe that we have to battle is not even Satan. It's the desire of my own heart. That is what can kill off even a plant that is already germinated, even one that is almost a fruiting stage. And you see, the wickedness of the third one is that it allows the plant to grow. So that seemingly, in the eyes of everybody, oh, this plant is growing well. It will never bear fruit. So we shall be watering this plant, we shall be manuring it. <laughs> Manure as much as you want. It is the greatest art of deception. And of all the three, what Jesus is saying, oh, you can fear Satan, but don't fear him as much as you fear the desires of your own heart. And the worst enemy that you can have. And today we want to talk about the ambivalence of priestly power. I've began, I've named it, make a seraph serpent, Numbers chapter 21 verse 8. 
ambivalence of priestly power. Now, what are we actually talking about? We're talking about this passage in Numbers chapter 21, in which, of course, we know this passage off by heart, in which um, the Lord says to Moses, Take a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. One of the big problems of scripture is really to understand what this image is all about. What, what is this about? A serpent on a pole. There have been many attempts to try to unravel the meaning of this. You know, one of the interesting approaches that some scholars have put forward is that, you see, the pole represents plant life vegetation while the serpent represents animal life so the plant and the animal together represent the whole of creation everything that God has created and that is a possible uh, explanation might um, allude to the fact that God has power over the whole of nature and perhaps that he puts this power into the hands of Moses whatever a possible solution but uh, I think that the solution is actually as almost always the case the solution is to be found in the scripture itself in fact where in the scripture do you find talk about a pole and a serpent a rod and a serpent and casting my mind around there is one passage of scripture remember when Aaron and Moses went before Pharaoh and there was a rod in Aaron's hand and they cast it to the ground and that rod turned into a serpent and then uh, the Egyptian magicians did the same and then Aaron's serpent swallowed those of the Egyptians and then Aaron would hold the snake of the serpent and it would return to a rod the serpent rod business you can find in exodus chapter 7 verses 10 to 11. the rod serpent is there now clearly we know what the rod signifies rod is that staff in the hand of aaron the hand of moses by which he stretches over the red sea and it, it opens up into two for them to go it's the power of god to save by the same rod you know they struck the rock in the desert and water came out you know and so on and so forth so the rod is, is clearly a positive power one by which god delivers his people shows that he is mighty uh, moses will strike the dust you know and the dust will turn into um, insects you know to afflict the egyptians and so on and so forth so the rod is clearly uh, a symbol of God's positive power to save. The serpent, we have no doubt what it is. Right from the book of Genesis, chapter 3, we know what the serpent is. You know, the power of evil um, that will strike the heel, you know, of the, of, of, of the man and so on. So it's clear in Numbers chapter 21, God is sending Sarah's serpent to, it's a symbol of evil. There's no question about it. So rod, the positive power, serpent, the negative power. Both powers in the hand of one man, Aaron, the priest. The power for good. And the power for evil. Remember that the rod is Aaron's rod. 
the priest. And in that rod, there's every ambivalence. The priest is that man who has the capacity for every good that you can imagine, but also capacity for evil. Now, if you read from 2 Kings chapter 18, reading from verse 4, there is a very interesting passage which is hidden from our sight. Now, many of these passages, unfortunately, never make it to the pages of the lectionary. So, we hardly have the benefit of reflecting on them. But, this is the time of King Hezekiah, who is doing a piazza, piatto pulito, cleaning up, you know, all the mess that is in Israel, in Jerusalem, and everywhere. And he's breaking down everything that is idolatrous in the land. And he goes to clean up even the temple. And what do we see? He removed the high places and broke the pillars and cut down the astera. And he broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. For until those days, the people of Israel had burned incense to it. It was called Nehushtan. Bronze serpent. We thought it was lost until we went to find it inside the temple. And the priests are burning incense to it. Don't blame the Israelites. Blame the priests. Uh, if there was any tendency to idolatry in Israel, it didn't happen without the priests. Go back to Exodus chapter 32. Whole issue about the bronze, the, the golden calf. After Moses had gone up the mountain. It's Aaron who is saying, you know, uh, okay, who has any gold or silver here? Bring it and let's throw it into the fire and see what we can make out of it. It looks as if, you know, these interesting people we are calling priests are the ones to lead Israel positively. But if Israel is going astray, you can lay it at their doorstep. They are the ones. Decide on it. Same ones. The path of good and the path of evil. You know, the priest is that man who can lead people to God. Um, there's, there's, no, there's no telling what a good priest, a holy priest can do. But I tell you, a priest can be leading you to hell and tell you, my dear, look, don't worry, this one is okay. Life and death are in his hands. Life and death. I want us to go to another um, story. You remember the guy called Job? And something that I love about him. Um, if you read from the book of Job, chapter 1, reading verses 1 through 5, following, it talks about Job and his sons, you know, and Job, meticulous guy, says that even overnight, you know, he, he was so worried that maybe his sons or his daughters, you know, had gone to party and a party too hard. Job therefore wake up in the morning and offer sacrifices for them and say, look, maybe yesterday while they were partying, they might have blasphemed against the Lord. 
So I will offer a sacrifice, you know. Who is Job? He's a priest. Writers of the Old Testament are definitely priests. They tell their own life story in the lives of everybody they are talking about. So, Job would send and sanctify them, Kedesh, like we saw, and offer burnt offerings, holocaust. That was Job. So it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their heart. And thus, Job did continually. Now, you remember that when Job began to have his afflictions, and Job's wife would come to Job and say this to him, Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Do you still hold fast to your integrity? And you know what integrity means? Integrity means having only one element. Yesterday we talked about the Thomas affair, the twin spirit. Do you still hold fast to your integrity, your oneness of mind? Even, even his wife knows that the ordinary thing is to have both the serpent and the rod. And she says to Job, Varek Elohim Vamut. Curse God and die. I have disturbed you with this Hebrew phrase, not just for anything but for a purpose. Look carefully at the word here. If my cursor is looking at it, this is the word, Varek. Is the word you know as Barak Obama or Baruch. It is the word for blessing. If somebody is called Benedict, that's the meaning of your name. In Hebrew, the word Barak can mean two things. It can mean to bless and it can mean to curse. Depending on how you read the phrase, Job's wife was either saying, bless God and die, or curse God and die. When a priest is blessing you, ask him what he's doing. Come down and let me cut off your head. It's one of the things that I have scratched my head about. That the word Barak, which we have seen from the first day, is the word which defines who a priest is. Numbers chapter 6, that you shall bless the people of Israel. May the Lord bless you and keep you and, and let the face shine upon you. That is the definition of a priest. It's an, amb an ambivalent way. An equivocation on the way. Don't trust entirely. If the priest is blessing you, keep your eyes open.
the serpent and the rod are in one man's hands. One man. And you see, look back at our own ministry in our own lives. We can do so much good. And every one of us here has done so much good to people. But if you begin to look at the damages, you want to wonder how come the two of these things can coexist in the same person. The priestly power is strangely ambivalent. And every time we have to try to be maintaining the rod and avoiding the serpent. Remember that they keep going back and forth. The serpent becomes the rod. Rod we are good men but our capacity for evil is unquestioned The original sin in Israel, like I mentioned, you can look at the doorsteps of Israel. It was Aaron who said it. Take up the rings of gold which are in your ears, in the ears of your wife, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the rings of gold which were in their ears, brought them to Aaron, and he received the gold at their hand and fastened it, the graving tool, made a molten house. And they said, These are, the, are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw this, he built an altar before him. And Aaron made proclamation. He said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to Adonai. Which Adonai? Which one? Everybody can see that this is a modern cow. Aaron says it's Adonai. A priest is the one who can make you see white when the thing is black. Saint Teresa of Avila, she said, the two most dangerous things to the soul are the devil and the bad spiritual director. And we could put it differently. Yeah, but Akashi is nodding his head. He's an expert. <laughs> we say, if I quote wrongly, you pardon me. We have the capacity for good, but we have the capacity for evil. Let's not forget it. We have to try to keep it in check. And you see, friends, people keep coming to us because
because of the rod that we have, because of the capacity for good, they will not stop coming to us. Because of the goodness of the priesthood, because of the barak, the blessing, they will come. And God has given us those gifts and he wants us to use it to bless people. But I want to pass on to another image in the scripture. There is a passage which we all know about very well because we've preached about it several times. Fig tree in a vineyard. I think that's a very interesting image I want us to reflect on. I don't know to what extent it's connected, but let's look at it. Now, what is it about a fig tree in a vineyard in which the, the Lord says, you know, uh, the, the, the vine dresser is going to look at this fig tree planted in the vineyard looking for figs? What, what is the whole issue here? Now, you know what a vineyard is. And in fact, I think even it was on Monday we had a reading about the vineyard. And one thing that is clear even from the reading that we read is the amount of effort that you put in to to grow a vineyard oh in fact almost all the passages whether i read from isaiah chapter 5 or read from the gospel the process is the same a man chooses a very fertile portion of land because if you go and plant a vineyard anywhere else it won't it won't work forget it very fertile piece of land usually on a hillside so that the drainage is perfect he builds a fence around it labor intensive you must keep animals out the day full and me go through your vineyard that's the end of it you need a fence he digs it he gets the choicest vine why because if you're planting a vineyard, those vines are likely to be there for the next 150 years. You get the wrong type of vine, you're done. He builds a tower because you need 24-hour security. He digs a vat, a wine press, and so on and so forth. Those you, 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 you invest. And every time you must go pruning, John chapter 15, making sure it's not overgrown. If you don't do this, Italian they say la tecnologia è buona quando funziona and the technology is good when it works it doesn't work okay. <laughs> let's go on let's go on so the issue here is that you in fact even for planting vines or vineyards you actually need a mediterranean climate the mediterranean climate is such that it has a number of months for the wet season not too many four or five months and it has an extended dry season and the effect is that during the wet season the, the grapes will gather the water and during the dry season they begin to store this water in the grapes so in fact if you plant a vine in takradi it won't do well because that vine will become a lazy vine it will just be taking the water and will have no need in the dry season to store water so it won't fruit it's a very particular plant you need to know how to grow it in fact 
if you look look at the text it calls the person who was looking for the fruit the vine dresser he didn't call him a farmer a great caller no it's a vine dresser a vine dresser is somebody who can pay particular attention to the plant if you take a cassava farmer to let, take care of your vine you won't have anything And the parable says that there was a fig tree in a vineyard. A fig tree is like a mango tree. Nobody waters a mango tree. Nobody prunes it. Nobody wastes time on it. Like a dawa dawa tree. Just go into the bush to fruit. Nobody sprays it. There are red ants on it all the time. You don't need to put any pesticide. It will do fine. There's a, there's a fig tree in a vineyard. A fig tree is getting the kind of attention that vines get. Pruning, protecting it, making sure nobody touches it extraordinary care if that fig tree does not bear fruit what excuse does it have you've given a fig tree the kind of care you give to vines and still it's not bearing fruit. Cut it down. I see all of us, without exception. I remember when I came to spiritual year, one of the big confusions I had was that I said to myself, How come this church is so rich? And yet, it's like all the riches are reserved only for a few. <laughs> you and I are spoiled for spiritual nourishment. How many people get to be schooled in the things of God for seven, eight, nine years before ordination? So much has been invested in our intellectual, human, moral, academic formation. You are a fig tree in a vineyard. If you don't bear fruit, you don't have an excuse. That's to me this passage is the illustration of the life of every priest. <laughs> we are spoiled for how much the Lord has invested in us to be able to come back to him and say we could invest it. And yet, the danger remains there. Remember the story of the Ethiopian eunuch and Philip in the road to Gaza. Another story that touches me deeply. This Ethiopian eunuch by the way, most probably he's a black man. 
and he had come all the way to Jerusalem to worship for the saints. A minister of the Candace, queen of the Ethiopians in charge of her treasure, had come to Jerusalem to worship. In fact, it's not the first time that somebody has come from Ethiopia to Jerusalem. Remember the Queen of Sheba? She came to Jerusalem when she heard of the wisdom of Solomon and she was completely blown away by the amount of knowledge and wisdom the death of what she found in Jerusalem. A thousand years down the line, another Ethiopian has come to Jerusalem, came, spent all his time and money, was going back on the Gaza road, and he had no knowledge, no understanding, no wisdom. Jerusalem was empty. Jerusalem had nothing to offer. But on the road, Gaza Road going back to Ethiopia, unfortunately, and a young man called Philip, one of those chosen in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 6, filled with wisdom, the spirit of Solomon and the Holy Spirit, would go and explain to him what he was reading from the prophet Isaiah. A danger of people making pilgrimages to our church every Sunday. Going back like a disappointed Ethiopian, you know. Jerusalem is empty. Coming and looking for the good. Not only disappointed. Now, let me just maybe bring this part of our sharing to some kind of a conclusion by maybe talking a bit about our capacity for good as well as our capacity for evil. You know, there was some time yeah, there was a discussion going on that I followed about uh, a priest who had gotten involved with a young lady. And all were contributing to the discussion. And naturally, a priestly fraternity is a positive thing, kicked in. We're all concerned about the fact that, you know, this priest has gone this way. We're also castigating this girl who is perceived as a gold digger, you know, coming to put our brother in a certain situation. And true, that could be the case. But I began to be worried at a point. See, every day, vulnerable people are knocking at our door. And if they go out into the world, the dangers against them are massive. You know that there is no free lunch. And when they come to us, shall we be a blessing? Or a curse. 
A world out there is corrupt enough. You know that. But will the faithful find refuge under our wings? It reminds me of an incident that happened years ago after our illustrious left his office in my feeble hands. And I was in the office one day A young girl, barely 15 years. Not I mean JSS 2 or 3 or something like that. Walked into my office. In fact, that was not the first time she had come in. She had approached me a few times asking for school fees, something like that. And she comes to my office about a third or fourth time. And I had had enough, so I went, picked whatever money I had, and gave to her. And after I gave this money to this girl, this JFS girl, after receiving the money, is looking at my face in a way that I should understand. And I literally put my hand on my head and said, even a JSS girl understands a social contract. But uh, Kevin Wilson wants to know what happened at the end. <laughs> Neither did the Ethiopian eunuch. <laughs> Just imagine. My brothers, the world around us, you know, is corrupt. And we ourselves have the capacity for both. We have the capacity. I think one of the things that should guide us is mercy. And the fact that may this beautiful ministry that we have, this barrack in our hands, which the intention for which it was given was to bless. May the Lord deliver us from making it become a curse. And the fault lines between the two are so thin and so narrow. A little inattention, a little sleepiness, and that which was given into our hands as a blessing becomes something else. I think that should be enough for this morning. May the Lord strengthen us. Amen.